At the center of a white dwarf, you'll find the most compact matter known to humankind. Degenerate matter. This stuff is crammed so tightly that there isn't room for electrons and nuclei to form atoms. A white dwarf has the mass of a star, compressed into the size of a planet. Yet somehow it doesn't collapse on itself? Get ready for the most ridiculous physics story I've ever heard. Hey crazies, this story begins all the way back in 1926 with this guy, Enrico Fermi. He wasn't even thinking about white dwarfs. He was just trying to quantize monatomic ideal gases. Are you gonna explain what that means? Okay, I'll go into it, but it's gonna take a while. It's gonna feel like I've gone on an extra long tangent, but I promise it'll be relevant. Imagine you've got an ideal gas at room temperature. Let's say helium-3. I've chosen helium-3 for a reason that will become apparent later. The behavior of the atoms in this gas is well described by Maxwell Boltzmann statistics, where particles are treated like tiny bouncy balls. That being said, trying to break models is a tried and true method in theoretical physics. Enrico imagined what would happen to this gas if it were cooled near absolute zero. That's when he noticed an inconsistency with Nernst's principle, or what we now call the third law of thermodynamics. So, you know, kind of a big deal. It says, as temperature approaches absolute zero, the entropy should approach some finite minimum value. Enrico took this law very seriously, so the fact that his ideal gas didn't obey it was a problem. Its entropy would actually approach negative infinity, not zero. Okay, fine, his gas stopped being ideal. Moving on. Except that's not how physics works. You can't just say, oh, I guess the law doesn't apply. Oh, well. If your circumstance deviates from the established model, then you have to tackle why it's doing that, in what ways it's happening, and by how much. Otherwise, you can't arrive at any new ideas. Dismissing what exists without proposing alternatives is not productive. Enrico knew this, which is why his paper includes adjustments to both the ideal gas law and the entropy relation. But in order to get there, he had to apply this newfangled physics known as quantum mechanics. Bold of him to use a brand new thing, but that's Enrico for you. Anyway, let's say you're removing thermal energy from this gas. Maxwell Boltzmann statistics would have us imagine the gas particles slow down and get closer together, ultimately stopping at absolute zero. But if we consider quantum mechanics, things get a little weird. The process starts out the same, but if we get close to absolute zero, the gas particles become quantum particles. Their locations and movement become less defined, meaning Maxwell Boltzmann statistics was no longer sufficient to describe them. Enrico would need to invent a new type of physics, which we'd later call Fermi-Dirac statistics, named after Enrico Fermi and Paul Dirac. We'll get back to that Paul guy in a bit. The point is, this new statistics takes advantage of the particle's random hazy movement. Even if we could reach absolute zero and remove all the thermal energy, there would still be activity, which means there must be some kind of minimum energy within the gas. A Fermi energy, if you will. We also refer to this gaseous state as a degenerate gas, or Fermi gas. There is an alarming number of physics things named after this guy. Whatever, how does that fix the entropy problem? Well, there's a couple ways to look at it, but the simplest way is to say, rather than absolute zero, the system can only reach a minimum non-zero temperature, or Fermi temperature, which keeps the entropy finite. Yes, that was his name again. And it was a brilliant solution, not only for its simplicity, but also because it had consequences beyond anything Enrico could have dreamed of. Are we getting back to white dwarves now? Yep, that's exactly what we're doing. Later in 1926, astronomer Ralph Fowler was reading Enrico's paper and had an epiphany. What if these compact white dwarfs were made of degenerate gas? It was a bold claim that needed to be justified. So naturally, he assigned this to his best doctoral student, Paul Dirac. Remember that name? The ultimate question they were trying to answer is the same one we're trying to address in this video. Why don't white dwarfs collapse on themselves? They have masses comparable to stars. That amount of self-gravity requires a lot of support. An actual star is releasing energy from fusion to support itself. A white dwarf doesn't have that, yet it still doesn't collapse. Ralph and Paul wondered if white dwarfs could be made of one of those Fermi gases. 
Since those gases have a minimum energy at absolute zero, they must also have a minimum pressure at absolute zero. What if that pressure could be large enough to support the mass of a star? How can a gas model be used on something that isn't a gas? It, it's a terrible name. We only call it the Fermi gas model because the original thought experiment used a gas. But it applies to any collection of what Paul called fermions, because of course he called them that. The helium-3 atoms we chose earlier just happened to be on this list. This gas model also works at temperatures well above absolute zero. Enrico only used absolute zero in his thought experiment because at normal temperatures, the thermal effects were masking the tiny quantum effects. Removing the thermal energy means the quantum energy can become impactful, no matter how small it is. But that's not the only way to expose it. We could just as easily make the quantum effects bigger. It would give us the same result. And that is exactly what white dwarfs do. These things are so compact that the gravity is even more insane than the temperature. Here on Earth, we experience 1g. That's one amount of Earth's gravity. The sun's surface, on the other hand, is 28 g's. That's 28 times Earth's gravity. Seems like a lot, right? Wrong. Sirius B, the closest white dwarf to Earth, has a surface gravity of 400,000 g's. That's 400,000 times the gravity we experience here on Earth. Absolutely bonkers. This crazy amount of gravity compresses the matter so much that the quantum effects are bigger than the thermal ones. And just like thermal energy can create a pressure, so can quantum energy. Those quantum effects are supporting the white dwarf. So which fermion is exerting the outward pressure? Well, let's take a closer look at what's in there. About 99% of the mass of a white dwarf is inside this core, which is mostly compressed carbon. Oh, it's like a giant diamond. Uh, ah! I'm gonna stop you right there. While carbon under high pressure and temperature does form diamond, the conditions in a white dwarf are too extreme for molecular structure. They're too extreme for atoms. The core is made of degenerate matter, which is ions. So it's plasma then. Ugh, it kind of, but not really. A plasma is made of ions because it's hot. Degenerate matter is made of ions because the particles are too close together. It's so compressed that there isn't room for electrons and nuclei to form atoms. Even at absolute zero, it would still be ions. But only the electrons can exert any kind of significant outward support. Electrons are fermions. Carbon nuclei are not. Electrons are the reason white dwarfs don't collapse on themselves. They're free to roam the entire volume of the dwarf as a sea of subatomic particles. And they act in exactly the same way that Fermi's helium gas did. So the model applies. There's a minimum energy, which means there's a minimum pressure. But for that pressure to be significant, the matter has to be highly compressed. A white dwarf happens to be the mass of a star crammed into the size of a planet. I don't know about you, but I'd certainly call that highly compressed. This stuff is some of the densest matter in existence. Imagine cramming something like a mountain into a semi-trailer. Like, what? But isn't there still some outward thermal pressure from the heat? <sighs> sure, I mean, these things are hot as blazes. But that thermal pressure isn't nearly enough to support the dwarf's weight. You know what is, though? The quantum pressure from the electrons. It's exactly the amount needed. So this guy, Enrico Fermi, publishes a niche paper on thermodynamics, which is then read by Ralph Fowler and applied by Paul Dirac in a context it was never intended to be used. And we get the craziest model for white dwarfs we could have ever imagined that is somehow named after Fermi. Not Dirac, not Fowler, Fermi. Yeah, we're definitely obsessed with this guy. And until next time, remember, it's okay to be a little crazy. Huge thanks to ACS for supporting the channel at the Einsteinium level as a YouTube member. Our supporters make this show possible and there are many ways to contribute. So check out the links in the doobly-doo if you're interested in helping. Many of you asked if Sirius B could have been captured by Sirius A later in life. Unfortunately, that was one of the first things that astronomers ruled out. It's good that you're asking though, it means you're thinking like an astronomer. Anyway, thanks for watching.